In August of 1783, Jacques Charles and the brothers Robert launched a small hydrogen-filled balloon from Paris. When it landed at Guinness, the frightened villagers, taking the balloon for a monster, attacked and destroyed it. September 1783, in a courtyard at Versailles, Marie Antoinette watched the ascent of the first aerial passengers, a cock, a duck, and a sheep. The cock broke its neck on landing. Several onlookers later swore it had been kicked by the sheep. In November of the same year, Jean-Francois Pilatre de Rosier and the Marquis d'Arlon rose 3,000 feet above Paris in a hot air balloon, paving the way for all the aeronauts to come. For a hundred years or more, we've used balloons for scientific study, to understand the motions of the atmosphere. But there's a difference now. The balloons of modern science, offspring of plastics and electronics, can reach far beyond the modest dreams of yesterday's aeronauts. To an obscure site in the Texas Plains near the town of Palestine, scores of scientists come from around the world each year to loft questions toward the distant edges of the stratosphere. It's called the National Scientific Balloon Facility. Established in the early 60s as part of the National Center for Atmospheric Research, the facility is designed to provide complete engineering and technical support for balloon-borne studies. At any one time, the staging bays may hold as many as half a dozen scientific teams making final equipment modifications and calibration checks or waiting for their turn to launch. Their experiments are apt to show a wide diversity of interests, from cosmic ray astronomy to atmospheric chemistry. Within hours, a group from NASA's Ames Research Center will fly this telescope to an altitude of 100,000 feet in order to make infrared observations of the cosmic clouds from which stars are formed. Water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere blocks out most infrared radiation before it reaches the surface. At 100,000 feet, the telescope will be above 99% of the atmosphere. Beautiful. Preparations for the launch are already underway. The NASA telescope will lift off from a specially designed launch vehicle weighing 52 tons. The Palestine crews have nicknamed it Tiny Tim. In these spark chambers, physicists from the University of California hope to find evidence of antimatter in the universe. Their instrument is a superconducting magnetic spectrometer. In one flight, it will record the trajectories of 30,000 cosmic ray events. If even a single trajectory bends in the opposite direction, it may be proof that antimatter exists. For this evening. At least six hours prior to flight time, a launch notice is filed with the Federal Aviation Agency, and the scientists are given a weather briefing by the balloon facility's staff meteorologists. 48 miles east-southeast of Palestine. Your maximum winds on climb out, 85 knots at 40,000 feet. Minimum temperature, minus 69, in the layer from 60 to 62,000 feet. 
Rigging lines are attached to the gondola while it is held in place by Tiny Tim's large mechanical jaws. Packages weighing more than three tons have been launched from Tiny Tim, but the average weight is slightly less than a ton. Continuing on up to float, you'll be located 45 miles east and southeast of Palestine. For tonight, the moon uh, wipes out our first objective. So it would be worth our while to get to float at uh, 2200 instead of 2100. To get to float. Yeah. Now, is that going to complicate the launch at all? There shouldn't be any difference because this launch time is sort of midway in between the uh, sunset. I mean, it's essentially 25 to 35 minutes ahead of, of uh, sunset, and your new launch time would be about, what, 25 minutes later. Launches are usually scheduled for close to sunrise or sunset when surface winds are lightest and there is minimum cloud cover. In addition, Many flights are planned for the spring and fall turnaround periods when upper level winds are gradually changing direction. During these periods, winds in the stratosphere become very light and balloons do not drift as far from the Palestine area, allowing longer flight durations and hence more data. Using a small pilot balloon or pie ball to determine local winds, a crew member selects the optimum location and direction of launch. The surface wind limit for launching with Tiny Tim is about 10 knots. To minimize handling, the balloon is brought to the launch pad still in its shipping crate. A spool truck will hold the balloon during inflation and release it at the moment of launch. Ground cloths are laid down to protect the balloon train when it is stretched out prior to launch. Unlike a hot air balloon, the high altitude balloon is only partially inflated, usually with helium. During ascent, the gas will gradually expand to fill the entire sphere. What, the signal turn? Yeah. Oh, I see. Well, I think that's because of the antenna down here. We've got a truck and everything in front of it. But uh, we'll raise it up just a little bit in a minute. The parachute assembly, already rigged to the gondola, will be attached to the balloon neck. The crown of the balloon is restrained by the spool assembly. This is the area that will be filled with helium. The connecting device contains explosive squibs for separating the chute from the balloon when the flight is terminated. This will allow the payload to be parachuted safely back to Earth. Does it pull the thing back? Or no, let's see. As we start filling yeah. This will go up when it up. When the assembly is ready, the helium lines are inserted into the inflation tubes of the balloon. The amount of gas to be used must be carefully calculated. Overinflation or underinflation could easily ruin the flight.
five minutes, Clarence. The launch is given final clearance by the FAA. That's affirmative. It's been approved. A set of lights on the rear of Tiny Tim controls the launch sequence. Red signals the spool release man to get ready. On yellow, a pie ball is sent up to show wind conditions at the moment of launch. On green, the spool snaps open, releasing the balloon bubble. driver maneuvers Tiny Tim under the ascending balloon. When it is directly overhead, the jaws holding the gondola open and the flight is underway. Line clear. Palestine Balloon Center, flight 744 Papa was off at 05 past the hour. The total balloon payload flight train stretches out some 600 feet, as tall as the Washington Monument. Tracking is accomplished by a variety of methods, including theodolite, radar, and electronic navigational systems. A chase pilot will fly along the flight path with the balloon to provide tracking information and to assist in recovery operations. 744 Papa is out of 30,000. Uh, it's on the 215 radial break County. It's 58 GME. The balloon's position is reported to the FAA at 10,000 foot altitude intervals up to 75,000 feet. Data transmissions from the balloon package are processed and recorded by a computer in the operations center at Palestine. The flight electronics include a pulse code modulation or PCM system, which allows the scientists to monitor data in real time and to update the system configuration as necessary throughout the flight. The system also provides the flight crew with a command capability for controlling balloon functions such as the release of ballast or helium, and for monitoring such parameters as altitude, temperature, and command verification. Once the balloon has reached float altitude, its position is plotted every half hour, and the information is relayed to the recovery aircraft. Okay, we're at 50,000 feet. Okay, DC. Right. The expanding helium has changed the balloon's profile until at float altitude, it encloses an area large enough to hold a football field. Should we be probably, it may not be any better this time, hard to say. No, it'll be more to just pull this time. Eh? It will be all fine this time, whereas it's probably point one or one yeah. another. Yeah. Like Definitely the, uh, the, the spectrograph, dare I say, because uh, in the lab anyway, it's a much, much better. Well, we should, should get better, we should get all this noise. Yeah, the burning, yeah. 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 That should make a lot of input difference to the system anyway. Mm -hmm. The length of the flight depends on the nature of the experiment. A typical flight might last about 12 hours from launch to cut down. The Houston Center, in car 4-3. We're giving you five minutes notice for termination. We have the balloon in sight. Because of light winds at float altitude, the balloon has traveled only about 120 miles. With the flight still in progress, others are already being planned. To ensure the success of each flight, the balloon facility staff meets regularly with incoming scientists.
to review flight requirements and technical specifications. During the busy spring and fall wind reversal periods, there may be a launch each day. A year's operation will include some 70 to 85 flights. Uh, Trinidad and... North Dakota, Trinidad and Hawaii. But Hawaii has gone down. Yeah. In Houston Center, we have a confirmed termination on balloon flight 745 Papa. Commanding for other functions is accomplished by providing two identical command receivers wired with corresponding command outputs in parallel. These receivers utilized independent internal power supplies. An optimum interface between the electronics of the scientific package and the flight support package is critical. Through the use of a new consolidated instrument package designed by the facility's electronic shop, much of that interface has now been standardized. 30-inch diameter ring of stainless steel tubing is installed by the manufacturer in the crown to keep the canopy deployed and assist in proper opening. Shroud lines terminate in 16 risers rated at 4,000 pounds each. Balloons, rigging lines, and other hardware undergo constant testing at Palestine. Because of its stringent standards, the National Scientific Balloon Facility has achieved an unprecedented record of success in scientific ballooning. Uh, Marvin, we just spotted the package down here. It's when a flight has been terminated, the pilot directs a ground recovery crew to the touchdown site. About 20, 25 miles from Maney by road. We'll be uh, looking for a road to get you in here in a few minutes. And I'll be traveling on Highway 1. They so call themselves roadrunners. Their job is to find and recover the scientific payload. You'll be able to drive with about two or three miles of it on a paved road. Get in the deep woods, mother. Meanwhile, preparations are underway for the next launch, scheduled for sundown. The huge magnetic spectrometer of the California group is wheeled out of its bay for rigging to the launcher. To soften the impact of landing, crush pads are usually secured to the package. In this arrangement, styrofoam coffee cups make a simple but effective cushion. Ballast is used to regulate the balloon's rate of ascent. Its release will be electronically controlled by ground command. need a four-wheel drive uh, to get into it and uh, drag the package out, looks like. Okay, understand though the package is in good shape. It's not wet or in the water. No, it's not wet or in the water. It's in uh, good shape. It's not even beat up too bad. Is there a little road that cuts off, a dirt trail that cuts off from that corner there out towards the package? Yeah, it goes almost all the way, uh, there's a road that goes right up to it. That's the reason I say a four-wheel drive vehicle, uh, preferably with the winch on front because there's a creek down here that we have to cross. Members of the scientific team often accompany the roadrunners to help in recovering the data package.
Recovering the payload or the parachute is seldom an easy job, but over the years the Roadrunners have recovered virtually every package launched, usually with little or no damage to either instrumentation or property. Mac, yo, I'm gonna get a few small ones right in here so they don't sweat. They just kind of overrode it. That's all. Overrode the magnet. All right, just barely. Barely, yeah. Demagnetize this one. Right, the last we're getting the balance drops that we thought we were. So we thought we were out, and we still had like 100 pounds. Yeah. Well, the thing thing don't happen this time. Yeah. Well, not if you measure how much you got. Yeah, but if it, if that big magnet messes up ours, then we don't get the float that we think we got. That's what happened. Give me some. As the afternoon wears on, not everything has gone smoothly on the launch pad. Gusty surface winds have remained longer than predicted, and it has taken a while to solve an unexpected hitch in the electronics package. As it is, the launch will be shortly after dark. Any further delays might push the launch time too late, and the flight would have to be canceled. But luck holds. The lights will be on in the control room tonight. And tomorrow, the Roadrunners will begin another search. <laughs>